Good morning, stakeholders, and welcome to the Office of Procurement Regulations Procurement in Action Series Session 1. I am Tamara Roy, Head Corporate Communications, and we're extremely pleased that you're able to participate in today's session. The team who will be presenting today will be comprised of the Head of Procurement Policy Development, Ms. Pastora Brown, our Legal Policy Research Officer, Ms. Hafsa Suknanan, and our Policy Officer, Ms. Devika Singh. Before we begin the formal aspects of today's proceedings, please allow me to go through some helpful tips for a successful session. Please note that your mics will be muted during the session. Your questions can be sent via the chat option on the Teams platform. These questions will be collated by our team and addressed in our question and answer segment at the end of the session. Please keep your contributions helpful and be considerate to our presenters and other participants. At the end of today's session, you will be invited to provide your feedback. So feel free to help us improve future sessions to better match your needs by letting us know what worked well and what did not. Please note that this session is being recorded and will be shared via email and uploaded to our website. So without further delay, we now ask Ms. Pastora Brown to introduce the session. <clears throat> Good morning to all participants and a very warm welcome to this morning's segment of the Office of Procurement Regulations, Procurement in Action series. You may be wondering how we came up with this series of training sessions. Well, the Office of Procurement Regulation has been in operation since 2018. From then to now, public bodies would have been reaching out to us on a regular basis for guidance on issues related to public procurement, retention and disposal of public property. Over time, we began to notice some commonalities in the types of requests that come to us. More so, we were able to recognize that some of the queries we received could have been traced back to the first stage of the public procurement proceedings, that is the planning stage. Accordingly, this procurement in action series is specifically designed to provide all participants with the opportunity to practice some of the tools and techniques that are an integral part of the planning phase for your procurement projects. Today, we kick off the first of the six training sessions that we have scheduled. Each session will be held twice daily, two sessions per month to make it easy for you to attend, and they will be held two this month in September, two in October, and two in November. On each day, the morning session will run from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, and will be repeated during the afternoon of the same day from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Participants are reminded that they must attend all six sessions to qualify for the Certificate of Participation from the Office of Procurement Regulation, and they are also required to complete the multiple choice questions at the end of each session. And I really want to make a plug here because what we've, had, what we've noticed with the registration is where we probably should have had, let's say, 100 persons registering for the, the morning session. For 
each of the six sessions, we are finding that the numbers are varying. So let's say we are seeing 100 for uh, today. Then for the next session, we are seeing 85. And then for the other session, we might be seeing 125. So we want to re remind participants to be mindful. If you would be interested in receiving the certificate of participation that the office will be issuing to particip participants who attend all six sessions and who complete the multiple choice questions at the end of each session. Remember, please, that you do not want to miss any of the sessions and you also want to ensure that you do participate in the multiple choice questions. Remember that with technology being what it is, we are very well aware of all who would have registered, all who would have attended, all who would have participated during the session. So we just wanted to remind you to please ensure that you attend all six sessions. Even if you may make a little switch up and say, well, OK, I will attend the morning session now for module one, but for module four, because I have something else going on, I will attend the afternoon session. That's OK, because as I would have said before, the same content will be delivered during the morning and the, the afternoon session. So I hope everyone got that and you will be participating fully. So just to remind you, because I think we would have provided this information on the invitation letter during the month of September, the two sessions will cover first the annual procurement plan, uh, and that will be a review in order to tie in the rest of the sessions. And you will see how that works. Then on September 20th, the session is entitled Market Research Report and Analysis. So it's going to be progressing from day to day. Uh, in October, we have sections three and four, and those will be developing requirements and specifications, followed by developing the procurement strategy. And then in November, sessions five and six will be procurement methods and procedures, and supply contracts, followed by evaluation methodology and contract management plan. So as I welcome you once more to today's proceedings, I would like to leave with you a quote by Alexander Graham Bell, the person credited for the invention of the telephone. And he said, before Anything else, preparation is the key to success. And as you would already know, this statement is quite relevant to public procurement. I would therefore like to encourage everyone to participate fully in each of the sessions so that you may, der may derive the maximum benefit and more so that you will be able to take back with you the tools, techniques, and strategies you will be practicing during these sessions. And you will be able to use those tools, techniques, and strategies to help you to strengthen the planning of your procurement projects going forward. So without further delay, I would hand you over to Ms. Tamara Roy. Thank you so much, Pastora. We are now back with our presentation on the annual procurement planning process, which will be delivered by Hafsa Suknanan. Hafsa. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the session. Today's learning session starts with a brief look at the annual procurement plan, followed by a review of the annual procurement planning process, then we will go into some detail on the various tools used in planning your annual procurement activities. 
and to make sure you are listening, there'll be a case study and assignment. After this, you get to ask us some questions. And in addition to all these exciting things, there will be five easy multiple choice questions for you to answer online. Then, to close off, we will recap the key points from today's session. It is our intention to be more hands-on, show the practical application of what is contained in OPR's general guidelines and webinars. And hopefully, by the end of today's session, you will be able to complete your own annual procurement plan. Lucky for you, this session is just in time for the new financial year. Today's session is on the annual procurement planning process, and the OPR would have held two webinars, one in 2020 and another in 2021 on the annual procurement plan. These sessions went into great detail on how to develop your annual procurement plan. For those of you who may have missed these sessions, you are encouraged to access the video recording via the OPR's website. We will now share these links in the chat. As mentioned, today's session will be more hands-on. And, and the reason for this is because planning represents the phase in the procurement process with the highest potential for savings. So we want to focus on, on the tools that would help you get value for money from your procurement activities. By the end of the planning process, public bodies will have an annual procurement plan and documented strategies for moving all their procurement activities forward. If the planning is done well, value for money will be realized as you would have considered all the factors and applied the most appropriate strategies. So here we have a short uh, definition of a short description of what the annual procurement plan is. So it's a document that the procurement entity must prepare at the start of the financial year. This plan contains all necessary information on the entirety of the public body's procurement activities for goods, works, and services that it plans to undertake within the financial year. At this time, I would like to highlight two general guidelines published by the OPR that are relevant. The first would be the general guidelines on developing the annual procurement plan, and the second would be the framework for internal control for procurement. We will share a link in the chat for these documents. You are encouraged to have these two guidelines handy when preparing your annual procurement plan. So you have to do a plan. Let's touch on what goes into the plan. When we talk about procurement items or procurement activities. It is the same information you have at your fingertips from your budget presentation preparations for recurrent PSIP and IDEA. With the exception of salaries, wages, other types of personal expenditure, utilities, and debt financing. So all the other things public funds are spent on will go into your annual procurement plan and schedule. So now that we have a general idea of what the plan contains, let's delve into the purpose of the plan. The purpose of developing your annual procurement plan is for you, the public body, to have a detailed proposal for executing your procurement activities in a manner that would contribute to achieving your strategic objectives and programmatic goals, whilst also keeping to the objects of the Act. We just saw that the APP Annual Procurement Plan will identify not just some, 
but all of the expenditure items for the upcoming financial year. And we know this comes from your budget preparations. On this slide, you can see the areas which the APP will address. So the purpose of the annual procurement plan sounds high level. How do we get this done? In order to move your procurement activities forward and achieve your strategic goals, you have to employ the most advantageous mix of the five factors you see on the slide. One, procurement strategy. And when we talk about procurement strategy, we refer to the type of solicitation document you will use, the most relevant evaluation criteria to be applied, and also what contract management strategy would protect your organization's interests. Two, in your annual procurement plan, you will also have to decide upfront what procurement method you want to employ for each procurement activity, be it open, selective, single, or sole source. Also, what would be your procurement procedure? Would you use an invitation to bid, request for proposals, or even a request for quotation? Third, your plan will also determine what is the most appropriate contract management strategy for each of your procurements. You can use fixed price, unit price, framework agreements, just to name a few. Next, the plan also ensures that you identify your risks. So each procurement will have a different risk, different risks associated with it. Let's take the Ministry of Works and Transportation as an example. Perhaps some of the activities may need to be completed in the dry season. This means that in the rainy season, the rainy season increases the risk of project delay or even failure, and such specific risks should be identified when planning your procurement activities. And finally, when planning your procurement, you must think of optimizing the use of resources. This can refer to internal resources or it may refer to external resources. In summary, looking at these factors when it will enable you to place your procurement activities into categories and apply the appropriate treatments and strategies to prioritize the execution. Although we won't go into these factors in detail today, we will touch on a couple of them during this session and over the next five sessions, we will go into a couple more. Now we move on to procurement planning. And this is important because it is one of the prerequisites for the successful implementation of projects. I'm sure many of you have experienced being in the middle of a procurement activity or even at the implementation phase of your project. And you realize that in the rush to buy, procurement or the requisitioner didn't consider something necessary. For example, you needed a piece of equipment because the old one was stolen, but in the rush to buy, you didn't consider having a service contract or a maintenance agreement. The consequence could be no maintenance schedule resulting in costly ad hoc repairs, which could have been mitigated. Procurement planning is also important because it limits the scope on non-compliance with agreed procurement procedures. We will go into the procurement methods and procedures in a later session, but here we are talking about how planning can help you select the appropriate procurement procedure, such as when is a request for proposal warranted or what type of purchases can be done using a request for quotation. Procurement planning takes you through the steps for identifying the most appropriate procurement procedure 
based on your organization's specific circumstances. Next, procurement planning can definitely contribute to achieving the objects of the Act, but let's zero in on accountability and transparency identified at A and C on the slide. When suppliers know what the public body will be procuring for the upcoming year, they can plan and allocate resources in order to bid for your business. This is really important in our current supply chain climate. How does this tie into transparency? Well, what happens when a supplier or salesperson says to a public body, hey, I have 200 blood pressure machines that I'm willing to sell you at one third of our regular price. What do you do? What do you do if this item was not identified for purchase in this financial year? I'm not going to give you the answer here today, but by the end of these six training sessions, I'm sure you will know the answer. Next, procurement planning provides a good basis for monitoring. So monitoring is continuous, and this is how you will see improvements in your procurement activities. It is how you will be able to measure value for money, savings in terms of spend, quality, and even reduction in transaction costs and time. And finally, procurement planning facilitates efficient and effective financial management. How? By spreading out annual procurement activities consistent with the needs and resources available. So that brings us to the end of the importance of procurement plan. Now, let's take a look at the annual procurement planning process. Step one of the planning process involves reviewing the organization's mandate and strategy. This is simply because procurement activities support organizational mandates or objectives on a daily basis by acquiring the necessary inputs for the organization to do its work. Step two of the planning process is twofold and involves analyzing the organization's procurement portfolio as well as the organization's procurement function and capability. Today, we will go into creating and analyzing the procurement portfolio. Step three. This involves identifying strategic procurement objectives, and this stems from an analysis from the analysis of step two. A few examples of such objectives may include to manage the procurement process and the supply base efficiently and effectively, or perhaps to minimize the organization's transactions costs of goods and services. Now, step four is the development and implementation of the procurement strategy, which is the completion of the annual procurement plan and the execution of the planned procurement activities in accordance with the identified strategies. Finally, at step five, we measure results. This involves monitoring the entity's activities and transactions to assess its performance over time and to evaluate the procurement strategies employed. Examples of monitoring tools may include annual procurement performance report, monthly or quarterly reports generated by the named procurement officer, and contract delivery progress and closeout reports. Now I will introduce you or remind some of you of the procurement planning tools. And really, this is the meat of today's session. After this, you will be able to classify your procurements conduct market analysis, understand strategic positioning, 
as well as undertake action planning. And this will be in relation to all your procurement activities, be it under recurrent, PSIP, or IDEA budgets. So the procurement tools are used to develop and analyze the organization's procurement portfolio. Why do you want to analyze our procurement portfolio? Simply put, we want to secure supply of whatever we need. We want to get value for money, be it from better prices, improved quality, or even reduced transaction costs. We want to take advantage of our purchasing power, and specifically, as the public sector, we want to move procurement from being a transactional activity to a strategic one. In order to analyze your organization's procurement portfolio, you will need the help of the procurement tools. Let's look at the tools. We have the Pareto analysis, Porter's five forces, and the Kraljic model on this slide, and the Kraljic model. My colleague will delve into these shortly with you. We also have the supplier preferencing model and the supply positioning model, which will also be discussed later on. And finally, the SWOT and PESEL tools, which we won't go into today, as most of you are familiar with them from your strategic planning exercises. And yes, these can also be used in analyzing your procurement portfolio. So at the OPR, we have been asked by public bodies whether they need to use all these tools in developing their annual procurement plan. The short answer is yes. No tool is perfect as it won't capture all the circumstances. So by utilizing more than one tool, you capture a wider cross section of factors to help you make more informed decisions. So all these tools are necessary to move your procurement activities forward. Speaking of moving forward, I will hand you over to Devika now. Thank you, Hafsa, and good morning, everyone. So as my colleague would have mentioned, the procurement planning tools I would now proceed to further explain them to you and hopefully provide you with a better understanding of how to utilize these tools more comfortably when planning your procurement. Now, the first tool we'll take a look at is known as Porter's Five Competitive Forces. And this tool would help you, the procuring entity, to understand and evaluate the competitive forces within the supply market. And it can further inform you as to the risk of supply for the goods, works and services you may wish to buy. Now this tool assesses five areas and the first area we'll take a look at is rivalry in the industry. Now, this examines how competitive is the market? Is there one or many suppliers or contractors for the item that you, the procuring entity, wish to procure? So when there's a large number of supplier and con suppliers and contractors, this generally increases competition and it therefore increases the supply for the goods, work or service. So just remember basic economics, an increase in supply means lower prices at the corresponding level of demand. So um, for example, there are approximately over 15 suppliers in the local market for copy paper. And we can determine that the market for this item is relatively competitive and the risk of supply is low as there are many sellers in the market. The next area of Porter's five forces we'll take a look at is supplier bargaining power. 
and this focuses on how much power that does the supplier have and how much control it has over the potential to raise its prices. Also, supplier bargaining power assesses the number of suppliers of raw materials and other resources that are available. It even looks at the location of suppliers which could afford them a more competitive advantage. Now, this is the kind of information we really look for when analyzing our markets. So if there's only one or a few suppliers, then the supply for the goods, work or service may be more difficult to secure. And therefore the risk would be high. So when the overall number of suppliers are low, for example, in the supply market for say mobile telephone services, where their barriers to entry are high, the supplier power would tend to be strong or high as well. On the other hand, we have buyer bargaining power. And this looks at whether you, the procuring entity, have greater power than your suppliers to influence the market. And again, this will depend on a number of factors including whether competition is high or the value of the contract and whether or not suppliers are simply even interested in doing business with you. Now, as a procuring entity, you will have high bargaining power when there are few buyers and, and many sellers in the market. Also, you'll have high bargaining power when when you purchase in large volumes of standardized products. Or if substitute products are available in the market, your buying power would also be high. The next area of Porter's Five Forces examines substitutes. And this looks at the availability of a product that you, the procuring entity, can purchase instead of the industry's product which can ultimately give you better value for money. Now, a very, very basic example of substitutes within this definition would be the procurement of, let's say, coffee versus tea, comparing the purchase of both items to determine which one would give you better value for money. Another example may be if your organization normally outsources, say, graphic design services and decides to do work in-house instead. It will need to consider the cost of buying specialized software licenses, powerful graphic computers, and other tools when evaluating which option will result in better value for money. Lastly, Quarters by Forces looks at new entrants. And here we consider how easy it is for new and new suppliers and contractors to enter the supply market. And can the procuring entity encourage new suppliers or contractors to enter the supply market? So if there are strong barriers to entry, the risk of supply for the goods, works or service will be high as there would only be a few suppliers in the market. And these barriers I refer to can include complex distribution networks, high starting capital costs and difficulties in finding suppliers who are not already committed to competitors. So to explain, explain this further, let us take a look at the market for say plumbing services for bathroom sinks. There's a relatively low capital cost to enter the market, making it relatively easy for new entrants to enter this market, which subsequently increases the supply for this type of service. Now, the next procurement planning tool we will look at is the Pareto analysis. 
And the Pareto principle, known as the 80-20 rule, is based on the premise that 20% of efforts can lead to 80% of results. So by, so by analyzing your procurement spend and identifying your procurement activities, which account for 80% of your expenditure, you can reduce your administrative efforts. But, but let us take a look at, exam, at exactly how this works by using just three simple steps. And you may want to pay particular attention to, do, to this work example as you will be asked to conduct your own analysis during today's session. So let us assume that Company X entire annual procurement portfolio consists of the following five items. Computer equipment and accessories, contracted specialized IT services, telephone, office stationery, and tuna. Now, step one of the Pareto analysis involves using simple a Microsoft Excel sheet and sorting the items in the portfolio listing by price. From highest to lowest, as you can see, we have done in the table. Where we started with computer equipment and accessories at $750,000 as the highest price item and ended with tuna at $10,000 as the lowest price item. Moving on, the second step of the Pareto analysis involves developing a running total. And we developed a running total of all expenditure items as shown in column five. Now this is done by simply adding the cost of each item as we move down the running total column. So for example, the running total cost at row three is equal to 1,400,000, which is the sum of computer equipment, contracted specialized IT services, and telephone. You should also note that the last cumulative or running total should match the overall total cost. The third step of the Pareto analysis requires that you calculate the percentage expenditure represented by each item. And this is done by simply placing a running total over the total annual cost and calculating a percentage. So for contracted IT services, we place the running total of 1,250,000 over the overall total of 1,500,000 and multiply that by 100 to get a percentage of 83.33%. And the outcome of our Pareto analysis in this example shows that the first two items, which are computer equipment and contracted specialized IT services, represent over 80% of expenditure. And the value of the remaining three items total less than 20% of the overall expenditure. Now, this would suggest that Company X should invest most of its administrative efforts in the procurement of the first two items in the list and should develop strategies to minimize its administrative efforts for the procurement of the remaining three items. And these strategies I refer to would be discussed later on in our presentation. Okay, so just a quick recap. 
So far, we've taken a look at two procurement planning tools. Portals by Forces and Pareto Analysis. Now we'll take a look at the Kralgic matrix, which I'm sure most of you would have heard of before. And this tool analyzes your procurement portfolio based on the relative expenditure and the risk of supply for the goods, works or service by placing them into various quadrants. Now, in determining which of the quadrants an item in your portfolio may belong in, you can utilize all of the procurement planning tools being discussed today. So, for example, you can use the results of your Pareto analysis to determine whether an item in your procurement portfolio belongs in the low or high value category of the Kralgic matrix, whereas you can use the an analysis conducted using Porter's Five Forces, which can help you determine whether an item belongs in the high risk category or low risk category of the Kralgic matrix. So let us take a look at each of the four quadrants of the Kralgic. Now, quadrant one, which is routine products, these are usually low value items with a low risk of supply as there are generally competitive local supply markets for these items. And items in this quadrant typically represents up to 90% of your organization's suppliers and a very high proportion of transactions. So based on our example with company X, an example of routine items would be office stationery. Moving on to quadrant two, which is leverage products, which are goods and services commonly used across the entire organization in high volumes, making them high expenditure items. The markets for these goods or services may be served by only a few suppliers with extensive distribution networks, resulting in low supply risk. So based on our example of company X, computer equipment can be considered as a leverage item. Quadrant three, which is bottleneck products, are highly specialized goods, services, or works that are often only provided by a few potential suppliers, making it a high risk item. And usually there are only a few transactions within this category. And an example of a bottleneck item based on our, our example with company X would include toner for a specific type of printer. And lastly, strategic products, which represents goods, services, or works that are critical to the organization. And it requires innovative solutions and high level expertise from suppliers. This category represents very few transactions. And there are often very few suppliers available, making the risk of supply high. The cost in forming contracts for strategic products are substantial for both the procuring organization and the supplier. An example of a strategic product would be contracted specialized services for a database system. Now from this diagram, it is much easier to see the categorization of each of the items outlined in the annual portfolio listing for company X within the four quadrants of the Kralgic matrix. So again, from our example with company X, toner is categorized as a bottleneck item with high risk of supply and low value. Routine items would be telephone and office stationery. 
contracted specialized IT services falls within the strategic quadrant and computer equipment and accessories is considered a leverage item. Additionally, you may want to keep in mind one, that an item categorized within one quadrant by one procuring entity may be categorized in a different quadrant by another, as this is often due to the varying procurement portfolio of each public body or changes in the market environment. Secondly, an item categorized as leverage, say in 2019, may fall within the routine quadrant in 2020. Thirdly, do not try to force items within a quadrant. It is okay if there are no items from your procurement portfolio within a quadrant. Example, button. Remember, it is the analysis of your portfolio and justification that is important. So now that we have concluded our discussion on Kraljic matrix, I will hand you back over to Hafsa, who will take you through some more procurement planning tools. Thank you, Devika. So we just have a couple more tools to discuss. Here we have the supplier preferencing model. This tool is about how the supplier sees you as a buyer. So we are the public sector. Our annual budget is usually around 50 billion TT dollars, less salaries and wages, utilities, debt financing, so probably less than that, less than half of that is spent on goods, works and services. That still gives us some pretty hefty purchasing power, right? Well, not exactly. How many times have you put out a tender and even though you know that there are, say, 30 providers in the country, all you get is five bids. And even then, not all of these bids are responsive. Why does this happen? So sometimes the answer is in the supplier preferencing model. And I say sometimes because I want us to remember that the tools give more accurate results when applied, not by itself. On the slide, you will see the horizontal axis, which is about spend. And we have gone through how to determine spend with Devika. So let's look at the vertical axis. This refers to how suppliers view your account. Is it attractive to them? Remember, we are not looking at it from the buyer's perspective here. With this tool, it is how your business measures up in the eye of the supplier. Let's go through the different quadrants of this model in more detail. So, as we go through the quadrants of the supplier preferencing model, please feel free to add your comments in the chat. The first quadrant is the nuisance quadrant, and this is where there's low attractiveness and low value. That's how the supplier would see you. You don't want to spend a lot of time being a customer here. You should have more than one supplier for the items that fall here. As the supplier takes your business, but is not really interested, and therefore you are at risk in terms of not being a priority for supply. Consider this. How many pest control service companies are there? 
welcome. Very few, in some cases, only one company would bid when public bodies put out their tender. I will leave you considering that whilst we move on to the next quadrant. This is the development quadrant where the supplier sees you with high attractiveness, even though the value of your spend would be low. This means that you don't spend a lot of money with this supplier, but the supplier is interested in doing more business with you. How many suppliers actually treat the public entities this way? Next, we move on to core quadrants. Here, there's high attractiveness and high value. And this is where you need your key critical suppliers to see you. Items that fall here warrant a close relationship. Both supplier and buyer see each other as important and will put in the effort to keep the relationship fruitful. Can you think of any products or services that would fall here? Finally, the exploitable quadrant. Here, there's low attractiveness, but high value. In this category, as a customer, the supplier has some power over you. And the risk here is that the supplier can increase prices, not always justifiably. And as a consumer, you are not in a position to do much about it. Facilities repairs comes to mind for me here. What do you think? So we've mentioned today that these tools should not be used in isolation. The supplier preferencing model is no different. This tool is best paired with the Kraljic matrix. Remember, the Kraljic matrix shows you the supply side risks. Therefore, when paired, this is the first step of supplier management as you now have a view of your business through the supplier's lens. Now, the final two. When the pandemic first hit, how many public bodies experienced shortages or outright supply failures? In one way or the other, most of us did. And the tool, the final tool we are looking at today is going to tell us how our business or service delivery will be affected if supply risks occur. The point of knowing this is to be able to plan for such an eventuality in order to minimize the impact. The supply positioning model takes the following elements into consideration. One, the risk that the item may not be available when it is needed. And the impact of the lack of supply on the organization. This model is designed to assist in ranking your procurements in order of importance and the level of your organization's vulnerability if the supplier or contractor fails to deliver. The supply positioning model can be used at various phases in the procurement process. From planning to market research to contract management. Since we are discussing the planning phase of public procurement, it is worth mentioning that identifying your contract management strategy is done in the planning phase. What this means is that you determine the most appropriate form of contract to be associated with the purchase, such as purchase order, framework agreement, fixed price, or even cost plus contracts. 
consider this. The provision of oxygen for a hospital facility in an at-risk district will be more critical for the Ministry of Health to secure than the procurement of office consumables such as paper or pens. Therefore, designing a fit for purpose contract management strategy early at the planning stage would be crucial to securing a stable supply of oxygen for the hospital. Using the supply positioning model, the number of suppliers willing to operate in this location may be revealed as a potential risk. And if this is so, this can then impact the supply of oxygen at this hospital facility. What can be done about this? Let's consider this whilst we look at the next slide. If you look at the slide, you will see the associated characteristics of each of the quadrants. For non-critical routine items, which are low risk and low impact, the strategy can be to outsource and automate your procurements. For this, you can use one-off contracts or purchase orders, even framework agreements for the items that fall here. Next, we would look at the leverage quadrants. What you want to do here is exploit your purchasing power and minimize your costs. To do so, you may consider the duration of your contract so you keep your options open as the market would have competitive prices. Next, we look at strategic items. These are high risk and high impact. What you want to do here is form a partnership and develop your contract around having a close relationship with your supplier. The last quadrant for bottleneck items is about ensuring supply. What you want to consider here, perhaps you want to give the market ample notice of your procurements, you want to give your suppliers long lead times for delivery, and to do so, you may wish to consider having a long-term contract to secure supply. So, Given the oxygen supply scenario from the previous slide, can you see the advantage of using this tool? Which quadrant do you think oxygen supply would fall into? Do you think a framework agreement with more, sorry, do you think framework agreements with more than one supplier would be an appropriate contract management strategy for this scenario? I hope you have an understanding of how this tool can help you in the planning phase. These strategies and more detailed treatments can be found in the Basic Procurement Handbook on OPR's website. We will share a link in the chat for this um, document. That brings us to the end of the procurement tools. So I now hand you over to Tamara. Thank you so much, Hafsa. So this brings us to the end of the first part of our presentations. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for rejoining us. At this time, we will now go into the case study and assignment, and Mr. Vika Singh will take you through this session. Okay, thank you, Samara. All right, everyone. So now we've come to another exciting part of today's session, the case study. And the case study would have been emailed to you all um, a few days ago, 
So we ask that you kindly access it for this part of the session. Um, for those of you who are unable to access it at this point in time, not to worry, we will also be sharing it in the chat section of um, this session for your ease of reference. All right, so now we are going to split everyone into breakout rooms where you will be given 30 minutes to complete an assignment, which is on the screen. And the assignment is to use the procurement planning tools, which we just discussed in our session today, to develop your portfolio analysis for an outfitting project. Now, at the end of the 30 minutes, you will return to the main room where we will ask one member from each group to share your screen and then present your answer for discussion. Now, in order to assist you in completing this assignment, we have also prepared templates for you to provide your response. Um, these templates I would now, um, which are now being shared in the chat. Yeah. In, yeah. Um, it is a Microsoft Excel sheet which contains four different tabs. Um, so once everybody has accessed it, I will go through the templates with you before we start the assignment. So hopefully we've all been able to access the sheet. So the first tab of the Excel sheet um, is the template for the Pareto analysis. And this has four columns for you to insert your information. The first column would be category. And this would refer to the items being procured. The second column would be a budgeted cost for each of the item. The third column shows the detail for your running total. And the fourth column should you should provide the percentage of your total expenditure. 